Hello, I'm Dan, the editor of Wargames Illustrated magazine. But more importantly, for this video, I'm also the editor of Nevermind the Bill Hooks Deluxe. Now, today I'm joined by Andy Callan. Hello. Andy is the author or games designer behind Nevermind the Bill Hooks, the original one and the uh, re new revamp version, Nevermind the Bill Hooks Deluxe. In case you don't know what that is at all, let's go back to the beginning, which was in September 2020 when we gave away this with this issue of War Games Illustrated. So it was a 16-pager uh, originally, and it was just focused on the Wars of the Roses. Um, and he's written for War Games Illustrated numerous times over the years. Over the years, yes, many times. Including the first, the very first one. Yes, drama. I had a set of rules in issue number one of, of War Games Illustrated yeah. uh, so, a long time ago. So he's got a good pedigree, we knew that already. Uh, but after we, after we gave this away free with the magazine, it kind of grew legs and donned some armour and sort did. Of ran off yeah. into battle on its yeah. own, didn't it? So, it, like I say, it was originally focused on War of the Roses. The new version expands out into <coughs> other theatres around Europe. Um, so let's talk about figure scale. 28 mil, yeah? OK, well, it was designed for 28 mil, but um, I'm not uh, prescriptive about it. People use other scales, and I'm not prescriptive about base sizes either. So um, with a bit of ingenuity, you can use, pretty well use any scale of figures with it. But ideally, 28 is what it's designed for. Yeah, it's, it's kind of old adage, as long as your opponent's doing the same thing you exactly, are, you're yeah. pretty much yeah. all right, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, that's really? right. Yeah, A little bit of overlap with base sizes isn't going to make a lot of difference either. Yeah, OK, cool. And uh, movement trays are something that uh, tend to feature quite heavily in Nevermind the Bill Hooks games, aren't they? And is, is that just is that a necessity? or again, It's not an absolute necessity. Topic? It makes life a bit easier and it makes the game run a bit quicker because you can pick up a... A, a, a tray and move it quickly where if you did in, uh, lots of uh, 12 individual figures it's going to take you a lot longer yeah hg uh, wells used to have all these figures uh, individually based back in uh, the did original he? little wars they must have games must have taken a long time then yes yeah well uh, um yeah i know he's an old friend of yours um <laughs> Yes, uh, other practical things to do with the rules as well. It tends to be quite heavy on dice rolls, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a buckets of D6 dice. Yeah. Uh, you roll D6 to hit and then D6 to save. And mm -hmm. uh, that's part of the fun. No, no game would be complete without the, the, the joy of the dice goddess intervening and spoiling your best laid plans. Definitely, yeah. Um, micro dice, they're just used for one specific thing, aren't they? Yeah, we stick them behind the archers to show how many arrows they've got left. Okay. Uh, because unlike in many medieval games, uh, you run out of arrows quite quickly in this Right, one. okay, cool. Uh, tokens, yep. um, well, we do produce a set of tokens, MDF tokens, okay. um, but you don't have to buy these because uh, in no. the in the new rule book you're going to get cut out versions yep. or you can download it from the website as well, but they yep. are integral to the game, aren't they? They are, they're used to show which units have been given orders, they're sh to show the state of the, the units in, it could be uh, in good order or it could be disarrayed or it could even be daunted where things are going very badly wrong for it. But people do... Um, you can use these tokens, or you can make your own. Uh, um, some okay. that are a bit more uh, attractive on the on the tabletop. Okay, cool. And cards as well. They're cards is a card driven. The turn sequence is card driven. Um, so you have you activate units according to which card, the order in which the cards are drawn, and then there's cards for uh, certain unforeseen events and special events that uh, can again spoil your best laid plans. Have the core rules themselves been changed in any way? Well, we've had two years of feedback from the international bill hooks community, and I'm pleased to say the core, the core rules haven't really changed much at all. There's probably 10 or 11 little changes we've made uh, of any substance. There's been a lot of improvements of wording where I've realised that what I wrote originally was too ambiguous and it needed to be spelled out a bit more. But I'm pleased to say that the 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 um, the basics of the uh, of the rule have, have remained intact. So anyone familiar with Bill Hooks One will be very familiar with Bill Hooks Deluxe. Okay, right, cool. So um, we've called that the Wars of the Roses Theatre Albion yep. because the sort of um, naming convention that we've yes. gone through throughout yep. Bill Hooks Deluxe yep. is based on the area of the conflict. It isn't is, yeah. It? yeah. So we've got we've got Albion of, as the Wars of the Roses, yep. and we'll go into some of the other ones yes. in, in a bit more detail. Yes. Um, but do, do they, can you mix and match? Is it, so can you mix Bohemia with Northumbria, for example? There's a, 
War gamers with long memories, like me, will have bad memories of the 1970s and War Games Research Group Ancient Rules, where you could rock up at a club with your Norman army and be expected to fight ancient Egyptians or mm -hmm. anything like that. Now, the time period of Billock's Dilux, as I've come to call it, is quite limited. It's about 1350 to 1525. Now, I would say your best pairing off credible contemporary opponents. Mm -hmm. um, so, but people will doubtless want to have Irish fighting Hussites or things like that. And if that's what they want to get up to in the privacy of their own home, that's fine. <laughs> but really, you should stick to what, yeah. what, is, what is credibly credible and historically feasible okay. to get the best results. Right, OK, that's, that makes perfect sense. Wars of the Roses being the core, yeah. and then we've gone to... Uh, 100, 100 Years, years War. Yeah, War. well, it, very, very early on, uh, within days almost of uh, this appearing in the magazine, um, I was getting feedback from people saying, well, why don't we use it for the Hundred Years' War? Or why don't we use it for such and such and such? And, such? and in fact, within three weeks, somebody had written a set for the Barons' War. Right. But the Hundred Years' War was something that uh, Simon McDowell, uh, another, another veteran war gamer, got into very quickly. And within, within a couple of issues, he was writing articles about using bill hooks for the Hundred Years' War. Mm -hmm. And he had some ideas of his own about how the rules might be adapted. And during lockdown, because uh, bill hooks was a BC cr before COVID uh, production, <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we played a couple of um, Skype games using um, Simon's uh, adaptations for the, for the Hundred Years' War. And I could see that they were, they, were, they were true to the spirit of the original, but putting a new spin on things. So for example, Simon's got a new spin on the English arrow storm and mm -hmm. the mechanisms of that are slightly different than they are in, in the uh, original bill hooks. He's brought some extra troop types in, like because the Hundred Years War wasn't just France, it spilled over into Spain and the Low Countries, so you've got Spanish light horse skirmishes and things like that, and you've, mm -hmm. got, you've got a different, another morale class of troops called rabble, which covers, you know, the reluctant levies from the, from, from the towns who were roped in at, at last minute. Um, so he has got some interesting ideas, but the core it remains the same, and it's true of all the other chapters really. You will find that uh, there are some specific rules and some new specific troop types, but if you're familiar with the original set, you'll be able to adopt to it, adapt to it fairly easily. Yeah, and, that, and that's the way we've, we've laid out the rules as well really, in some which is each theatre highlights the changes from the core rules. So you stick with the core rules unless you're told exactly, otherwise, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's that's one of the new theatres, one of yep. the, the big hitters. Uh, now there's a couple that you've wrote yourself yes. as well. Uh, just go through a couple of those. Well, I bagsied early on the, the um, Swiss Burgundian Wars, which we've called the Helvetia chapter, and the uh, early Renaissance Italian Wars, which we called Italia. So we're going to start with Helvetia. Now the thing Helvetia was difficult uh, because uh, you've got two very different armies. You've got the Burgundian army, which is beautiful and glamorous and multinational. Mm -hmm. And you've got the, uh, the Swiss army, which is big and plain and brutal. And um, in fact, in the three battles that the Burgundians fought against this, the, uh, the Swiss, they came badly unstuck in every single one of them. So, my original adaptation of rules for uh, Helvetia meant the Swiss were just completely unstoppable, which of course they were at the time. So I've had to tone them down a bit and try and make up, give, give some sort of advantage to the Burgundians. So the key thing with the, the Swiss was um, that unlike the Wars of the Roses armies and the Burgundian armies, they don't really have any leaders as such. They're more of a sort of democratic works committee. They get together the, the day before the battle, decide what they're going to do, and then just do it. So they, they, um, they have an internal command structure rather than being led by individual leader figures. In terms of the actual troop types, well, it was in the mid-1470s, so really the technology is exactly the same as it was in the Wars of the Roses, and we don't really have any new troop types. The only possibility would be... Uh, we have companies of crossbowmen in the Bur Burgundian army rather than just operating as skirmishers. But the pikemen, the knights, the halberdiers, they're pretty much, pretty much uh, a very easy adaptation. It was the command and control that was the, the difficult thing there. 
Okay, uh, and the other theatre that um, uh, you um, you wrote for the yeah. book was uh, Italia. Italia. Now that that runs from about the mid fourteen nineties to fifteen twenty five. Uh, so you're moving really from late medieval to early Pike and Shot, really. So there's a bit of transition there. The the the, um, the scenario in the, in the book for this chapter uh, has. Um, one where uh, the French army was commanded by a veteran of Bosworth, for example. So only 10 years, or I know 10 years on from that. Now, in those 30 pit years, what happens? Well, gunpowder weapons become increasingly important, and there's more and more of them on the battlefield. Um, the artillery, again, is becoming more important. It's also getting more reliable, so it's less likely to blow up than it was in the, in, in the, in the uh, earlier days. Um, still, you, but you've got some familiar troop types. You've got masses of pikes, for example, uh, and so um, they're going to form the bulk of your infantry. Um, on the other hand, you've still got you, some of the continental armies use masses of uh, knights or gendarmes, as they're calling themselves now. So you've got two very different um, uh, troop types, but both capable of very, very powerful charges. And they'll pretty well, either of them will sweep aside anything else. They, they cancel each other out because uh, you can't charge headlong into a, into a Swiss pike phalanx, as Charles found to his cost. But um, those are the ones that are becoming more important. The shot and the pikes, which moves us into the later 16th century, which is beyond the scope of this book at the moment. Okay, right, yes, good. That's just the, three of the theatres. The yep. other ones we've got in there are Bohemia, which is the Hussite Wars. Right. We've got Northumbria, which is the Anglo-Scottish or border reavers kind yes. of area and period. Uh, we've got Lusitania, which is warfare in Portugal. And we've got Hibernia, which yep. is warfare in Ireland. Yes. So we're adding in lots of great colour from these new periods yes. like Italia into yeah. the um, game. Yeah. Uh, so it's handy that in the back of the book, or towards the end of the book, we've provided a painting, modelling and kit bashing guide. Isn't yes, it? this was done by uh, Richard Lloyd, the very talented Richard Lloyd, also known as Captain Blood from the Lead Adventure Forum. And uh, Richard was a very early adopter of, uh, of Bill Hooks, and he was writing about it on the Lead Adventure Forum within days or weeks of the, this, this first appearing. It was also Richard who was... Uh, very keen on um, improving the uh, the battlefield look of the game. So instead of these little tokens, he was coming up with much more interesting looking things. And instead of a little dice behind them for the for the arrow supply, he was coming up with something something else. And he covers that in in that in that chapter. Mm. And then what he also does, of course, is is talk about his his very very uh, clever painting technique and his uh, great skills at kit bashing or converting. That is taking bits from one plastic set and gluing them onto another one in a, and to create create new figures and that's mm. that's a that's a, that's a use a very useful and interesting uh, part of the book and it, it it completes it because it shows that the the it's a whole gaming experience it's not just playing the game it's it's preparing the figures in in a particular way it's very useful yeah so it takes the game from the battlefield onto yeah. the hobby desk yeah, doesn't yeah, it yeah really? absolutely it, yeah he does superbly well it definitely uh, worth looking at just just on its own. Um, obviously, the game uses figures, and we should mention a bit about uh, a the figures that you can use, and b specifically the figures that we've used in the book. So I, I've got a bit of a checklist here because different areas we've um, we've used different figures in the book, which you can get yourself. So, for example, for the Wars of the Roses, it started out in, in this the sort of pre-release book, as we're calling it. We used lots of Perry miniatures, didn't we? Yeah, they, indeed, they yeah. Of, Perry Plastics. In yeah. fact, Perry Plastics were the go-to yeah. go to figure range for that. Yeah. Um, and they feature again in Gallia, because we've used... Perry's have got a great 100 years war range. We've also used some Foundry, some nice... Uh, uh, I think, I'm pretty sure these are Foundry. Um, and... Uh, for the free companies in the, um, I, I've got free company army myself, oh, so that good. was um, that was brought to bear when I was taking the photographs. Uh, front rank figurines feature a bit. Then for Bohemia, we've got Hussites. These fellows over here in their war wagons um, and first corps or Curtis were were. Um, very helpful in letting us photograph their painted figure collection, which is marvellous, and pretty much everything that you need for that theatre is in their range. 
Uh, Helvetia, I'm saying that correctly. Yeah, Helvetia, I think so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Um, so that's the Swiss Burgundian Wars. Again, you can you can go to Paris for the European Wars range, plastic yep. mercenaries yep. particularly. Yep. They look great. Um, and also, actually, into the Italian Wars as well. So these are Burgundians, but the, they same figures can be used for the Italian yeah. Wars, can't they? Sure. Um, we also went to the Assault Group um, and. For their Italians and Spanish, their early Italian wars range particularly, um, and then War Games Atlantic had recently released some uh, conquistadors, yeah. uh, which we could uh, bring to the table. Certainly, yeah. Uh, for Italy, particularly Spanish, very active in in Italy at that time. Uh, Northumbria. Now, uh, uh, no, the guy who wrote the Northumbrian section, um, Tim Gordon, supplied us with all his figures to photograph, which yep. was very nice. They come from they're the old Craven Images figures, which came from which are now in by Timeline Miniatures. Yep. Also, Flags of War making a new range of Border Wars figures. Colonel Bills makes some as well, which feature in there. Lusitania was. Um, there's not many people make. No, like they, they wouldn't. L Lusitania was was a sort of a bit. A bit left field of a ch as a chapter, but it's to show really that you could take the principles of, of, of the rules and apply them to some very niche areas mm. and just come up with some specific rules of your own to reflect that. And I think that's what Yao Especial has done there. One thing he does do is point you towards a very useful source of uh, material for the for the figures there, which is the Pastrana tapestries, which are absolutely amazing things mm. from the 1470s. And they have a completely different look to... Uh, the sort of thing you're used to from the Wars of the Roses. They, they're the same period, but a slightly different look, and uh, okay. certainly would give you some good opportunities for kit bashing that we've yeah. described in the in, yeah. in, in okay. the Richard Lloyd chapter. Yeah. Uh, we, in, in the book, we use some of um, Assault Group's figures again there from the Renaissance Spanish and Italian range, so they can definitely uh, be brought into action. Hibernia uh, antediluvian miniatures, they've got a small historical range called Islesman. Uh, and Perry Miniatures, The Wars of the Roses Kern, yes. which we'd originally used in the, um, yeah. in the core rules and then we, yeah. we brought back again. Yeah. As, well as, as well as figures, um, this is where I take on a bit of a sales pitch. Sure. Because, as, because although we're giving away the tokens in the book itself, so you can, you, you can photocopy those, you can cut them out, or you can download them as well, you can also buy MDF tokens. Now, we've, already, we've had a set out for quite a while for the core rules. Um, we're going to be producing some as well for the uh, European theatres, yeah. and the same goes for the uh, cards. So we did have the set of playing cards for the core rules, which is still totally usable. Yeah, uh, absolutely. If, yeah. if you're fighting in Albion or the Wars of the Roses, yeah. you can still use those cards. But we have got um, new core rules sat here, which is takes on the new design elements of the of the new game, uh, and. It does also include a couple of generic Europa cards. Absolutely, so yeah. We've, we've gone for the for the lion and the unicorn. The lion and the unicorn, that's, that's yeah. The generic, so generic ones. Yeah. So one important thing, Dan, is that these these cards are now designed to fit in standard size uh, card sleeves. Yes, so we listened to the feedback. We there, did, didn't we? absolutely. Yeah, so they're yeah. slightly smaller than the yeah. previous ones. Yeah. We've also got a deck of um, Europa cards, which is so big because there's so many different Indeed, theaters. It's yeah. actually yeah. two decks, but yeah. that, that's also available. Uh, so we've as well. got leader cards for uh, each of the uh, each of the new historical areas, mm -hmm. and each historical area has has a, has, a, has a small set of special events that are specific to that. To it that does, theater. yeah. You, you use the core special events for um, six of them. Nine, I nine think. of We've them. We've gone up to nine, nine now. Nine of them, yeah. Yeah. And, and there's, there's three, three extra for three the specials yeah. bring it up to 12. Yeah. Yeah. And it's available from the War Games Illustrated website. It's available from North Star. It's available from Arcane Scenery. And it's available for Khaki and Green in Australia. And uh, it's available from Ironheart Artisans in uh, America. So there you have it. Never mind the Bill Hooks Deluxe. And stay tuned to the War Games Illustrated YouTube channel for more on this same game.